We are in Mark chapter 9. We do uh, what we call expository preaching. It is biblical preaching. That means the point of the sermon um, is the point of the text. I, I don't have an agenda. I don't have an idea in my head in searching for scripture in order to support that idea. Rather, I go into the text and find the meaning of the text, and that's the point of the sermon. So we've been working our way through the book of Mark, and some of you are visiting. And so uh, today, you should have a firm grasp on the whole book. Uh, don't, don't leave, okay? I'm not going to take the whole, all day to do this. Uh, but I do want to bring us up to speed just a little bit so we understand the context and therefore uh, understand what Christ is trying to convey about himself and the gospel. The Gospel of Mark is the true historical and theological account of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ through narrative or story. The aim of chapter 9 is to illustrate the New Testament principle that while the kingdom of Christ has already been inaugurated and established in his disciples, it is yet to be fully realized. So for the first eight chapters, Jesus has been demonstrating his deity through his authoritative teaching and through his divine miracles. However, a profound shift takes place in chapter 8 where Jesus moves out from his public ministry to more of a private ministry uh, with the disciples. He moves away from the huge crowds that follow him wherever he goes. He moves away from, hopefully, the hostility of the religious leaders in order to concentrate on discipling or training uh, the 12 that he has chosen to carry on his ministry after he is gone. And so he takes every opportunity to teach them about their role in the kingdom of God. Suffice it to say, Jesus is the master teacher. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and there is no greater privilege than to sit under the tutelage of Jesus Christ. In fact, one of the major themes of the Gospel of Mark is discipleship. I know it's a word that we use often in Christian circles. Sometimes it's misunderstood, but Christ is going to define what true discipleship means. But I'll just cut to the chase. A disciple is a Christian. A Christian is a disciple. They're not two different things. They're the same things. A Christian is a disciple, and a disciple is somebody who follows Jesus Christ. And so, as Christians, we often refer to ourselves as Christ followers. And that is a big impact on where we find ourselves here in this gospel. Jesus is constantly teaching the twelve about the kingdom. And we have a front row seat in order to be discipled by the master discipler. And we will also learn from him how to disciple others. Because as Christians, we're called to replicate ourselves and others. We're called to be disciple-making disciples. I know that's a mouthful, but we're going to learn from the example of Christ and from the teaching of Christ. So in chapter 8, verse 27, Jesus clarifies his true identity by asking a question of the disciples. They unequivocally affirm that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And from that point forward, Jesus is going to speak to them and focus on his suffering, his death, and his resurrection. He's going to focus on that which is coming to the Son of Man, the suffering, the death, by way of crucifixion and the resurrection. Jesus is going to tell them what awaits them as well, as followers of Christ. But, but here's the good news. Beyond all that suffering, there is an eternal weight of glory beyond all comprehension. And so there is a crown for Jesus Christ and for those who are followers of Jesus Christ, but that crown only comes first through the path of suffering and hardship. Some of you know that to be all too true in your life as believers in Christ. Immediately following the prophecy concerning the cross and the resurrection in chapter 8, verse 31, he says this in Mark 8, 34, calling the crowds with the disciples, he said... If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. This is 
The call to salvation. And the call to salvation is a call to discipleship. And the call to discipleship is a call to follow Jesus. And the call to follow Jesus is a call to self-denial, to selfless service, and even suffering, if need be, for his sake. Christ couldn't have been more clear. You put that up and against the modern message that we often hear in Christianity today, there seems to be no similarity to the message that Christ preached. But make no mistake, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And for the rest of his time leading up to the cross, he's going to focus mainly on that call to discipleship and what it means to follow him. So if you are a follower of Christ here this morning, this is for you. If you're not yet a follower of Christ, then this is for you. I can't be certain about this, but right after Christ declares his death and resurrection, right after Peter denied this whole truth, this message is so hard to believe. It is so shocking for the disciples that their Messiah, their leader, was going to be crucified. It was so grievous to them that they may have to follow in his footsteps in this past of suffering. I think Christ, in his kindness and in his goodness, chapter 9, takes Peter, James, and John up on the mountain where he is transfigured and his glory is shining right before them. In a way to encourage them. Imagine Peter, the one who, who declared, Christ, it's not going to happen this way, where Jesus rebuked him, get behind me, Satan. And now here he is seeing the glory of God. How gracious is our Savior. And this critical lesson on the mountaintop was important for them to understand not only the person of Jesus Christ, but the work of Jesus Christ. Let me explain. After all, Jesus clearly said, The Son of Man will suffer many things and be killed. Chapter 8, verse 31. But their understanding, the Jewish understanding of this title, the Son of Man, was different than what Jesus employed. Their understanding of the Son of Man, I believe, is from Daniel 7, which would be a very similar. Now remember, Jesus used this title of himself more than any other title. 88 times in the New Testament we read where Jesus says, the Son of Man, the Son of Man, the Son of Man, referred to by Jesus and by others to him. And this, this title of the Son of Man was to be understood as another name for the Messiah. So when Christ says, the Son of Man will do this, the Son of Man will do that, he's saying, I'm the Messiah. I am the long-awaited deliverer, redeemer of God's people. But what did the disciples understand when he said the Son of Man is going to suffer and be killed? They understood from Daniel 7 this. I'll read it. Daniel 7, verse 13. I saw a night vision, Daniel says, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. This was the understanding of the disciples, of the Jews of that time, as to what the expectation of the coming of the Son of Man. It's going to be glorious. His kingdom is going to be forever. The nations will not, will not be able to thwart his purposes. I believe it's this Old Testament prophecy that the disciples had in their mind. But the point is this. They failed to put that together with another Old Testament prophecy concerning, concerning the suffering servant in Isaiah 53. They understood the Son of Man to be glorious and coming to establish the kingdom. They just did not understand that he would be a suffering servant. The idea of their Messiah being crucified was, was unthinkable to them. And so you understand that the disciples are looking for immediate glory. They're looking for immediate exaltation. They're looking for the kingdom to be realized here and now. They didn't understand what was to come before his glory. 
And so only after the death and resurrection would they understand that the suffering servant would enter into his glory as the Son of Man. And both are critical to understanding the person and work of Jesus Christ. Last week in verses 14 to 29, Jesus continued teaching his disciples with an object lesson in faith as the prayerless disciples were unable to cast out the evil spirit from the little boy. Today in verses 30 through 37, Jesus continues to teach the hard lessons of discipleship. And as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, these are lessons that you and I need to learn as well. And so I want to examine a hard lesson in discipleship from the master discipler. I'm going to examine under three headings. First of all, let's consider the message of discipleship. The message of discipleship. In verse 30, Jesus takes the 12 disciples away from Caesarea Philippi to Capernaum, where their home base was located. He didn't want anyone to follow him. For verse 31, he was teaching his disciples. Now we understand that this was a long journey, and I'm sure Jesus taught them quite a bit along the way, but Mark distills down the essence of what Jesus was teaching them in verse 31. For he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man, there it is, is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. But they did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask him. For a second time, Jesus predicts his death and resurrection, and for a second time, the disciples did not understand and Mark adds these words that they were afraid to ask him. Why didn't they ask him? Well, we can't be sure why they didn't ask him or why they were afraid to ask him, but perhaps it was because of the drubbing that Peter took the last time he challenged Jesus on this very subject. Or perhaps the disciples were shocked that their Messiah was going to be killed. Perhaps they were shocked by his instruction that they had to deny themselves and pick up their cross. Perhaps they understood just enough of the message and were distressed by the implications for their lives. If Jesus meant what he said about going to die, what would that mean for them? But the point Jesus is trying to make, friends, is he's repeating this theme again and again. The cross and the resurrection is the central message of the kingdom of God. It is the central message. Jesus is serious, dead serious, excuse the pun, in his commitment to this task. And the implications for them would be so overwhelming that I think the message of the cross was a stumbling block. The message of the cross was a stumbling block to the disciples as it is for men and women today. Their minds were set on the plans of men their minds were set on the things of the earth. Their preconceived ideas of the kingdom of God got in the way of receiving the clear instruction of Jesus Christ. J.C. Ryle said, quote, Never are we so slow to understand as when prejudice and preconceived opinions darken our eyes. And it's only through the gospel, friends, only the gospel itself, can cut through our darkened eyes. Even though it sounds like foolishness to those who are unsaved, we who believe know it is the power of God unto salvation. And so, even though Christ demonstrated his miracles and his healings, his miracles and his healings are not the message of the kingdom primarily. Jesus is not content with his disciples or anyone else promoting him as merely a faith healer or someone who just wants to bless them and make them happy and, and wealthy and healthy. Christ is not content with that message. In fact, when people were enamored with him and they came out because of his miracles, he said, don't tell anybody when he performed the miracles. And he said that I came out to preach the gospel. But he didn't even merely come to preach the gospel. Bear with me. He came to earth to make atonement for sin by his blood. 
He came to die for those who will repent and believe. He came to do the Father's will and to set in plan the redemption that was conceived before the foundation of the world to save unworthy sinners like you and I. Christ the miracle worker, Christ the healer, Christ the authoritative teacher, Christ the perfect atonement for our sin. Jesus' perfect life and sacrificial death would satisfy the holiness of God and assuage the wrath of God towards sinners. And this message would be carried on by the disciples after Jesus ascends to the right hand of the Father. And it's only after the Holy Spirit comes that they fully understand what he meant by his death and resurrection. We can be encouraged. We have the presence of the Holy Spirit today. We have the full revelation of the gospel and the implications unpacked in the New Testament. Friends, we have the gospel of Jesus Christ who can save people and we need to preach that to them. Regardless of their misunderstanding, regardless of their rejection, we preach and we pray that the Holy Spirit would open eyes and open hearts. Do we not? After all, that's what happened to you and I. If you think you had anything to do with affecting your salvation, if you think your faith is what triggered the electing love of God, then you're dearly mistaken. It is the sovereign electing grace of the Lord Jesus Christ who set his affections on you before the foundation of the world in time and space, sent his son Jesus Christ to come to earth and live a perfect life and die a sacrificial death. And at a certain time, the Holy Spirit quickened your heart unto faith and you believe in him and you trust in him. You turn from your sins and you turn to Christ as your only hope. Amen? Amen. That's what the gospel is about. And so, I mean, if you were going to pick 12 people who would choose God, you wouldn't have picked these guys. And you wouldn't pick me either. And we love him because what? He first loved us. My friends, we have another helper, the Holy Spirit, who convicts the world of sin, judgment, and righteousness. Do we believe in the sufficiency of Scripture and the enabling power of the Holy Spirit then we would pray and trust him to open hearts and minds to receive the word. Have you received the message of the gospel? Have you turned from your sins? Have you come to the point where you realize that you are lost, you are hell-bound, you are under the just wrath of God, deserving of all his punishment, and that you have no hope in the world except the cross of Jesus Christ? That's the message of discipleship. That's how we enter the kingdom of God. That's how we live in the kingdom of God. And that is the message of the kingdom of God. True followers of Jesus understand this message. True followers of Jesus are not interested in promoting their own self-interest. True followers of Jesus don't live for themselves, but live for him who died for them and was raised again. 2 Corinthians 5.15. And Christ makes this very clear in verses 33 through 35, which I call the attitude of discipleship. The attitude of discipleship. Verse 33, And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was going to be the greatest. Now, I just wonder if you would stop for a moment and just think about what's going on here. Just, just, just think about how they missed the point. Did they not just hear Jesus say they must deny themselves and pick up their cross? Did they not just hear Jesus say that he was going to be killed? So why are they arguing about who's going to be the greatest? Again, I think it's their preconceived notions of what the kingdom is like in the Son of Man. But once again, Mark drives home the weakness of their faith. He records the sad story of their argument over who's going to be the greatest. You can just imagine them making this trip. And, and here Christ is telling them about his death and about his resurrection. And they're like, oh, I'm just going to hang back here. And by the way, murmuring amongst themselves, who's going to be the greatest? I mean, this is unbelievable. Did they not even care that their leader was going to die only to think about themselves? 
What does this say about their commitment to follow Christ? What does this say about their sinful pride and their hard-heartedness? What does this say about our desire to exalt ourselves as Christians? I agree with Sinclair Ferguson who said, quote, If we did not know our own hearts, we would find it difficult to believe this really happened. But any disciple who knows himself hears the echoes in his own life of such unfaithfulness, end quote. Here's the good news. These are the kinds of people that Jesus chooses. <laughs> These are the 12 disciples that Jesus chose. Not many noble, not many wise. Oh, we're not, right? Look around this room right now. Don't do that. We're not very, we're not very noble. We're not very wise. There is nothing in us that would commend us to the grace of God. That's what makes it grace. It's important we recognize this reality. This is the kind of people that Jesus chose to lay down his life for. These 12 selfish, sinful, prideful sinners. Again, what an example of his sovereign grace. If these disciples chose him, they're a bad group. They didn't do a very good job. They didn't get the point. The love of God in Christ is what crushes their pride and our pride and self-exaltation. And God's love comes to us purely by grace. Not because of anything we deserve. It's important, is it not, friends, to recognize this propensity to pride in our own lives? I mean, really. We are bent inward towards ourselves. It comes very naturally to us. We are better, we are really, we think we're better than we really are. Right? And of course, the only antidote to the sin of pride is true humility. James 4, 6, but he gives more grace, therefore it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Philippians 2, 3, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. I can't go through all the texts that, that speak to the issue of humility. This is what characterizes the true believer of Jesus Christ. Humility. Pride, says J.C. Ryle, is an old sin. It's a subtle sin. It rules and reigns in many a heart without being detected. It is the most soul-ruining sin. It prevents repentance and keeps men back from Christ. Let us watch against it and be on guard. Of all the garments, none is so graceful, none wears so well, and none is so rare as true humility." End quote. Friends, this is a hard lesson for us to understand because this humility only comes to us by grace. The minute I think I'm cultivating humility in my own life, I've lost it. We don't give out ribbons for humility because if you pinned it on yourself, you would be guilty of pride. It's who we are. Ryle's right, it's the old sin. It's the oldest sin. It's as old as the garden. And it still rears its ugly head within us. We need to be on guard. We need to pray for God's grace to get our minds off ourselves and onto the Lord and others. But consider how patient Jesus is. How long-suffering he is with the disciples. He's not discouraged by their disregard for his life. Right? And every one of us, are, hey, did you guys not hear what I just said? What's going to happen to me? Right? He's not, he's not dissuaded by that. He's not discouraged by that. He's not angry with them for their indifference to the word. Our Savior is always patient, always kind, always loving, always instructing. I find that to be incredibly encouraging. In fact, one of the incredible marks uh, no pun intended the, the benefits of this book is for me to learn how to pastor and shepherd better as I look at the life of Christ how patient he is in teaching the word verse 35 he sat down and called the twelve and he said to them if anyone would be first he must be last of all he didn't he didn't 
addressed their argument on the road. He waited to assume the posture of a teacher, of a rabbi, and in one sentence he turns their man-centered ideas of greatness upside down. If you want to be first, you've got to be last of all. If you want to be great, you have to be a servant of all. True greatness in the kingdom of God is not looking down on other people. True greatness is the believer who immerses himself in the needs of others and who sympathizes with them and helps them any way he can. And ironically, Jesus will repeat, repeat the same thing in chapter 10, and these disciples will repeat the same mistake in chapter 10. Jesus will repeat for a third time his death and resurrection that's impending as he goes to Jerusalem. And guess what? James and John will secretly go to him and say, Hey, can we sit one on your left and one on your right when you get into your kingdom? Unbelievable. So what do we find in John chapter 10, verse 42? Jesus called them and said, You know that those who are considered the rulers of the Gentiles, they lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. This is wonderful. This is really heart-searching instruction for us, is it not, as we consider our own attitudes towards others in the body of Christ. Humility. Humility is what Christ demands. We're not following Jesus for praise and accolades. Again, he graciously chose us, and he calls us to serve his church in an attitude of humility. So who can you encourage today in the body of Christ? Who can you serve with humility in the body of Christ today? Who needs prayer? Who needs to be stimulated and stirred up to love and good deeds? Well, this attitude of discipleship is dependence upon God. And third, let's consider in closing the illustration of discipleship. As he so often does, Jesus uses a simple illustration to make his point. That's what I love about the Gospel of Mark, because stories or narrative are effective in teaching truth. I'll be honest with you, I tell horrible stories, right? You know, people are like, why don't you tell more stories in the public? It's like, I don't have one story that you'd be interested in hearing, let me tell you. Now, just tell the stories that Jesus tells. So, here he comes in verse 36. He took a child and put him out in the midst of them, right in the middle of these big men. And taking him in his arms, he said to them, verse 37, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. Now the Lord is illustrating the nature of the kingdom and also how to enter into the kingdom. Don't miss that. This is the requirement for entering into the kingdom, childlike faith, and this is the requirement for living in the kingdom, childlike faith. In fact, Matthew 18, verse 3, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of God. And he makes that point very clearly. True disciples must come to Christ in childlike faith. And nothing could be further from their cultural expectations. Jesus is telling the disciples, forget about your rank, forget about your prominence, forget about your exalted position. Focus on the needs of others, especially the least among you. And ironically, it was earlier in the chapter where the disciples could not cast the evil spirit out of the little boy because of their prayerlessness and their weak faith. And Jesus now, right, against all cultural expectations, takes the child in his arms and uses the child as an illustration to his disciples. Perhaps they didn't receive the child the way they should have. Verse 37, again, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. The name of Jesus is all that he is. His attributes, his character. So to receive someone in his name is to receive them in his love and in his character. And to love them the way Christ loves them. So how am I doing with that? child is an illustration of those who have least importance and little significance in the world and yet are brothers and sisters in the kingdom of God. Jesus says when you receive them, you receive me, you receive the Father. 
John 1 11, he came to his own, his own received him not, but to those who did receive him, he gave them the right to become what? Children of God. It is a requirement for entering into the kingdom, and it's a requirement for living in the kingdom. It's the application of discipleship. So in closing, let me ask you, what about you? Have you embraced the message of discipleship? Are you a Christian? Have you repented of your sins? And are you trusting in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ? When Jesus says he was delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him, and when he's killed after three days, he'll rise again, do you hear those words as merely some historical fact long time ago in a place far away? Or does this have meaning in your life? Do you believe that Jesus was talking about you? Do you believe that he was killed for you? Do you believe that he rose again for you? This is the message that Mark wants to convey. This is the message God wants us to proclaim. Are you willing to humble yourself and come to Christ in childlike faith and receive him and enter into the kingdom of God? Total trust, total dependence upon him. And if you are a disciple of the Lord, if you are a follower of Christ, do you live to serve him by serving others? Do you see the least significant person as the church as one for whom Christ died? And do you love them as Christ loves them? Let's pray that we would take this hard lesson in discipleship to heart. Let's pray for the grace to humble ourselves and exalt others, and in doing so, may we exalt the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The world does not need more Christians who are interested in self-promotion. The lost need to find their hope in the Son of God and in the Son of Man, who is glorious and powerful and has authority over all the nations. He's able to say to the uttermost all who will come to him and place their faith in him. And the kingdom of Christ will prevail until everything is placed under his feet. He has triumphed over everything that seeks to do us harm. He'll set every injustice right. We, we, we want instant justice in our lives, don't we? Except when it comes to our own sin. We want mercy. I want justice for the other guy who sins against me. But when I sin, I want mercy. Well, Christ is both just and merciful. And he will set everything right in due time. And so we should pursue that in our lives and in the marketplace the best we can by preaching the gospel and pointing people to the one who will set everything right, the one who will wipe away every tear, the one whose kingdom will have no end and the one who will reign and rule forever. So we can sing. We expect a bright tomorrow, all is well. Faith can sing through days of sorrow, all is well. On our Father's love relying, Jesus every need supplying, yes, in living or in dying. All God's people say, all must be well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your word and more than that, we are grateful for your mercy that is shown to us in Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, I pray that my words would carry only the authority that you would bring by your word. And I pray that your word would find soft hearts and fertile soil that it may bear fruit for all eternity. Father, I would be foolish to think that every person in this room is trusting in Christ. I, I hope they are. But if they are not, Lord, I pray that you would awaken them and make them see their only need and their only hope in life and in death is that they belong in life and in death to their Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, be glorified now and in the days to come that we would be Christians who are living out the gospel 
pray that you would provide opportunities to give the message to our friends and neighbors who are perishing. And, and again, I pray, Father, that your will would be done here on earth as it is in heaven and that Christ would reign. Oh, come, Lord Jesus Christ. We pray all this in his name. Amen.